as black people in America, it's like um, you're walking in, into a church and you smell like weed. Everybody's looking at you. And you wasn't even smoking the weed. You just kind of like walked past somebody's car and you just brought the odor in with you. Being black in America is like an assumption of guilt. When it's really the other way around. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> in reality. In reality. So, can you just talk a little bit about how you feel right now? I feel a strong sense of purpose. I feel connected. Part of that comes from the fact that I haven't been on social media. And the other is because I've been doing the self-work that has prepared me to face people who are once triggers and they're no longer triggers for me. So you can take off every mask. What does your style say about you? My style says that I'm simple. I'm laid back. Are you simple and laid back as a person? Yes. I feel like when I was younger, I was louder. After I got shot, I had to redefine what manhood was. I was shot when I was 19 years old. My manhood was really based on like external power. My ability to like make more money than somebody, my ability to like beat somebody up, my ability to like date more women. I got shot and those things didn't matter anymore. I learned that I didn't have to be loud to be powerful. I could just be myself. I could lead with love. Um, can you talk about the assumptions that people make about you based on how you look? Yeah, I think people assume that I need help. <laughs> Sometimes they assume that I don't need help. <laughs> Like, for instance, when I came in this room, there, there may or may not have been a, an assumption that uh, my cousin drove me here. Uh, but he slept the whole ride. <laughs> I actually drove the entire way from Pittsburgh here to New York. I used to be self-conscious to tell people I was shot because I kind of felt like there was this assumption that I was shot, whereas a white counterpart there may be an assumption that they were in a car accident, you know? And then, oh, don't let me tell somebody I was shot by a police officer. It immediately goes to, what did you do? Whenever I enter a predominantly white space, I could feel me adapting to kind of disarm them. What kind of things do you do? Smile, talk about things that they would be interested in. I would have, you know, a different tone in my voice. But now it's like, yo, I'm me and I'm going to show up as me, and I know I'm worthy. Before, I, I just felt like I had so much to prove. So can you like paint the picture a little bit of like what was going on in your life when you were 19 and, and, like, and then what happened? I was the average 19 year old. I was a year out of high school. I had applied to go to like this community college, right, going to a bunch of like college parties and like, it's turning up. Uh, it was a Sunday that I got shot. I was driving down the street. It was a one way and the police officers were coming up the wrong way. And I was kind of looking like, I told they you. They were I, coming up the wrong way and you were going the right way? I was going the right way. They didn't have their sirens on or anything. I told you I was like real confident. So I'm like, yo, what the, like, what are y'all doing? And I'm looking directly into their car, which is like, bro, when you're black, you're just not supposed to do that. And so, when I made eye contact with them, I knew that in that moment that they were gonna pull me over. Uh, and so what I did was I drove to the stop sign and as soon as I made the left and I knew they couldn't see me, I just sped all the way up to the next stop sign. I kind of hit two cuts, right? And I knew that they weren't gonna catch up to me unless they were really trying to get to me, even though I didn't like uh, break any laws. And so I'm driving over this bridge and I'm like looking at my, Rear view mirror, lights come on, here we go. And so the officer comes to, my, to the window. I kind of cracked it and like gave him my information and he snatched it off of me. So I kind of knew like, man, this is about to be weird. I knew I didn't have any warrants or anything. Right, I'm either gonna get a ticket or not. So yeah, they, you know, they came back to the car. Then they start uh, asking me about 
this guy named Lamont Ford. I'm like, bro, I don't know Lamont Ford. After a while, they started insisting that I was Lamont Ford. I'm like, bro, my, I'm Leon Ford. I knew they wanted to get in my car, but they didn't really have a reason to. So now they're threatening me. If you're lying, you know, we're gonna kick your ass and all this stuff. Now I'm like, man, this is, this is really getting weird. So I'm in my head, like, I'm, I'm pulling off. And so they open up the door and they're standing in the doorway. They try to grab me. And I hurry up and put the car in drive and try to drive off. What I didn't realize is they called backup. There was an officer on the passenger side. So as soon as I pulled off, the officer that was on the passenger side jumped inside my vehicle and he just immediately starts firing. How many times? Uh, five times. He's in the passenger seat? Yeah, he's in the, in the passenger seat. The gun is on my chest. Like I can feel the steel. I was so close, I thought he was tasing me. Immediately after I crashed, you know, get yanked out the car, they slammed me on the ground. I still was thinking that I got tased, but then I started, you know, having the blood coming out of my mouth and I could feel all the blood under me. And so they're going through the trunk, you know, where's the drugs, where's the guns? I'm like, bro, I don't have no drugs or, or no guns. One of the officers knelt like right next to my head and he was like, yo, I hope you fucking die. And I was just telling myself, like, bro, I cannot die. Like, I do not want to die right here like this. And uh, I just remember an ambulance coming. I just tried to keep talking. I gave them my grandma's name, my dad's name, my mom's name, grandma's phone number, my dad's phone number, mom's phone number, until I just kind of went out. And then I woke up in the hospital. I was on a 24-hour guard. My family. They weren't able to see me for like two weeks because I was under arrest. I remember a, a doctor coming in my room and he was like, yeah, we got good news and you, we got bad news. Good news is you're gonna survive. Uh, bad news is you're not gonna be able to walk again. What uh, happened to the police officers? He, he's actually a detective now. Nothing happened? No, nah, nothing happened. I was charged. <laughs> That's what really like kind of sparked my activism. I didn't have a lot of support from traditional leaders. And so I had to kind of build and create my own movement. I didn't get a lot of support because I didn't die. We live in a society that only respects death. You know, you have to die to get your flowers. When I went to civil trial, the, like the courtroom was empty. And this was like during the same time when Colin Kaepernick was, was protesting. Can you talk a little bit about like your, um, the emotions that you remember feeling like from when you became conscious again after and then getting home and all of that? I felt a bunch of anger. Yeah. Why um, did that kick in right away? Yeah, I hated all white people. A teacher, her name is Miss Shank. She was my sixth grade teacher and she just always kept up with me and she just gave me so much love. Uh, and so when she came to visit me, I was just like, well, I hate all white people but her. <laughs> and I was like, no, nah, I hate all white people. I hate all police officers. But then I had like some relatives who were police officers. So I was like, yeah, I don't hate them. I, I hate all the white cops. I don't know when the shift happened. Maybe it was one of my professors. Dr. Conti like trains police officers. And he always like invited me into these spaces to share my story with new, with new recruits. It was hard because I would get triggered all the time. Police officer would say, well, you, you know, your shooting, it wasn't justified, but this other shooting over here was definitely justified. I feel like from the moment I got shot, November 11th, 2012, to, you know, when I started therapy last year, it, all, it feels like one day, kind of like a emotional coma where I didn't allow myself to feel certain emotions. And whenever I did feel those emotions, it's because they were very intense. Because you were triggered. Exactly. And I was, would be triggered by a lot of different things. Sometimes just seeing a police officer, I would be triggered when I would hear other cases of police brutality. I would be triggered when, whenever I just, you know, look at my wheelchair and be like, yeah, I, I wasn't born like this. You know, somebody put me here, you know. Somebody took my ability uh, to walk.
people would applaud me because like, yo, he's a hard worker, he's ambitious. You know, he's, he's doing this, he's doing that. Oh my God, Leon is amazing. But that was really how I decided to cope. As soon as I got to rehab, I never was sitting still. I learned how to drive before I knew how to get in and out of the bed by myself, right? My dad had to carry me, like lift me up, put me in my chair, lift me up and put me in the car. I would be in the car all day until I could would call my dad and he would leave from wherever he was at to come help me out. I have hell of a parents. That love created in me this tenacity, right? To just like, to push through this resilience. I meet people, right? And they would look at me and like getting shot as like this huge hurdle. But then I look at them and I see their insecurities, their lack of self-worth, their issues with their parents. And I'm like, for me, that adversity is tougher than getting shot because I, I was raised around so much love. Getting shot was just like, all right, cool. How do I adapt? So, so you were saying that, um, like at some point the like busyness, like you hit like a wall with it where you felt like it was like you weren't dealing, healing. Or... Yeah. So I settled my case. And so I decided to run for city council. However, in the middle of my race, I got invited to a meditation retreat in Mexico. <laughs> and it was during that retreat where I realized that, yo, I don't really want to run for city council. I flew back from Mexico. I decided to see a therapist. The day after my session with my therapist, I dropped out of the race for city council. I broke the lease to my apartment and like flew to LA. And then from LA, I went to Montreal, Canada, then I went to Philly, then I went to Europe. And I believe because of you know that experience between leaving America, going to therapy and practicing you know meditation, my life completely changed. When do you feel the most vulnerable? I feel the most vulnerable when I'm trying to suppress my vulnerability. Such as. There have been like police shootings where I told myself that, oh, it's okay. You know, I'm fine. I'm not bothered by it. And this is before going to therapy. So I suppressed those feelings and they end up surfacing another way. What is different now is that I'm able to say, I do care. I am hurt. I am sad, I am frustrated, I am angry. You know, once I acknowledge those emotions, I can kind of let them go, which it's liberating for me, right? Because I don't beat myself up. Healing is acknowledging that I do have love in me, but I also have fuck the police in me. I have a little bit of a lot of things that, you know, I don't like, uh, and we all do. Right? Um, so whenever I do see a police shooting or I am frustrated and I do like say to myself, man, like, man, fuck these people, you know? Um, I don't beat myself up for it and say, yo, now I'm a bad person. Now I'm not authentic. Because being authentic is, you know, allowing yourself to go through all of these different emotions. How has that been with like intimacy and like, um, my perspective of love um, has changed. I thought love was to provide, protect, and possess. But now I understand love as the will to nurture one's own and another's spiritual growth. I haven't found that person yet. And when people say you shouldn't have a list, my list is someone who has a strong sense of self, a self-actualized human being who is connected to purpose, has the, the will to share her truth, her light, and her love. Uh, not just me, but the world. Why in your body? Why in your skin? Why in your journey? Why is it a good place to be? To be me? Uh, I, <laughs> I, don't, I love me. I don't know. It's like I, I'm here for a reason, and I know it.
I'm just embracing my nature. And my nature is to love. My nature is to be present. And my nature is to give and share myself with the world around me. I believe that all of my life experiences have molded me to be exactly who I am, to be where I am. There's a reason why my name's Leon, right? There's a reason why I grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, there's a reason why I was shot. Before I transition from this body, I hope that that reason is revealed uh, to the world. That's why, you know, I'm grateful to be here in my skin. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, we're Elisa and Lily, the mother and daughter creators of Style Like You. We are also really excited to let you know that you can get the extended version of this interview in the What's Underneath podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're inspired by Leon's story, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel over here and share his episode with any friends or family who could benefit from remembering that they are enough as they are. And don't forget to click the bell so each Thursday you're reminded of when we've dropped a new episode. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts to all of our members who continually support our growth. You can join them by heading over to patreon.com slash style like you.